Welcome to Plug and Play Productions. We're here at the round table at the Alexander Park with Dr. Justin Tewin, PhD, the co-founder and lead coach of Meta Excellence. Meta Excellence is a multi-dimensional program rooted in four meta tools. Metacognition, or thinking about thinking, is a boss of the human mind. It helps you monitor, regulate your thoughts, and choose between your different thinking skills. A specialist in the field, Justin's here today to speak about how to transfer metacognition into everyday life. Thanks for taking the time to the podcast. Justin, tell us about how to, how to um, metacognition can help artists turn their passion into profits. Thanks for having me, John. Really appreciate you having me, having me here today to talk with people about that. So when we're talking about directing passion into profits, and specifically for artists, something to think about is how do we declutter the mind so that we can focus on the goal, right? So if we're, uh, I think you mentioned an example of a artist when we were speaking before the show. You mentioned an example of an artist who's looking to uh, put together like a production, like a little mini film. And if we use that as the example, I can walk you through some of the basic steps. And when we're talking about putting together any production, even if it's something as simple as building a piece of furniture, you know, what's the first thing that most people think about? It is a diagram. Ideally, they would think about the diagrams, right? You open up the instructions and you look and you know what you should probably do? You should check the box, make sure you got all the parts, right? right? So when you're putting together a, a large production, you got to think about what equipment you need. You're going to have to think about what your team is, what skills you have. You're going to need a storyboard, right? Before you even sit to filming, you're going to need to have a plan in place. Planning is the, there are two most important skills that we need to think about when we're engaging in any activity. Planning is the first one. When we take time to plan, the most important thing that we can do is figure out what are our resources, what do we have available, how much time do I have, how much energy do I have, and what's going to be the best way to use all of that, right? If you have $10 million to put together a production, it's different than if you have $10,000 or $10. Those are different kinds of productions. Can we start with $10? <laughs> of course, of course. So suppose that you're doing it with $10. Right? Mm -hmm. You're putting together this production. Now you're going to have to think, well, I don't have money, but maybe I have connections. Maybe I have people. People that I know who are interested in building up their resumes. People who are maybe retired, wanting to do some coaching, pass on their resources to others. Maybe there are some creative ways that I can bring in talent that showcases what they're doing because the work that we're going to put together is going to be big. I'll give you an example of a real film that did this. Do you remember the Blair Witch Project? Uh, you might the, the name of it the name of it in yeah parts of the it, trailer, it was, it was in I theaters didn't I didn't watch it either I didn't, I didn't watch, watch it either. but I know that that film was made with forty thousand dollars and it made it made millions right and it was a really novel creative way they did it with just camcorders they didn't have like the sophisticated big budget hundred thousand dollar per camera equipment they used what they had and they put together a plan and they leveraged what they had to their advantage. They said, oh, we got this, like, these little camcorders. We're going to make it like it's a whole movie. And that's going to make it scarier because it, it was a horror film, right? Absolutely. And that started a whole genre of horror films. Wow. That started thereafter where they wanted more of that shaky camera feel and, and more real. But it started with, well, we didn't, they didn't have the budget to do all those things. So they leveraged that into how they told their story. Okay. Right? So it starts with that plan. Now, when you're using the furniture example in combination with this, this film story, when you're building the furniture, you don't just look at the diagram and then go. You look at the diagram and you start building, and then you look back at the diagram, and you're like, Does, is what I'm doing matching the original plan? Absolutely. You have to keep consulting back to the plan. And does it look like the box you put? That does you it look like the picture on the box? box. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yes, does it yes, look yes, like yes. that? So Final. when, yeah. Final so result. so when we're putting these things together, when you're making your film, you're gonna have a storyboard. I'm actually doing this this week. I was putting together a little storyboard of an animated GIF that I wanted for my for my company when we send out emails. Mm -hmm. And my graphic designer, she had some really cool ideas, and I said, send me a storyboard. So she sends me. Here are the four images. Right, it's just a 10 second thing, so just four images to tell that story. And here's what I'm thinking I want it to look like. And I said, great, now we've got a plan, give me a first draft now. 
then she'll give me a first draft and I'm gonna look back at the plan and see, does this, do these two things match? And what's nice is if you do that, notice I'm doing that before it's even done, just the first draft, and I'm already looking back at the plan. We have to do it, and, and so in the case of filming a larger production, you know, say like a 10 or 15 minute film, something like that, you're gonna to wanna to look back at your plan and say, are we on time, is this on point, or have we deviated from the plan? It's okay to deviate from the plan, to change it, because sometimes we do gotta change our course. Absolutely. Right? Sometimes we gotta change our course. But if we change our course, we have to mindfully do it. So we might have to adjust and make a new blueprint, set up a new storyboard, so that our, we then know what to film next. You know, when you're filming, you don't film it sequentially. Unless you're doing something live like this, you usually film it in pieces. Absolutely. Right? Home Alone, they filmed everything in the house all at once, because they only had access to the house for a couple days. And then they filmed everything else in a school nearby and they rebuilt some of the rooms that were in the house in a totally other set. So that all took planning. It takes some thinking about where you're gonna do. And that's when what your storyboard comes in place. Exactly. So you gotta have that plan. Now here's the funny thing. What the research tells, tells us and what I saw in practice and what I see with artists and with business owners is most people, they do know that they gotta do a little bit of planning, but they forget to check back on the plan. So a really quick, easy fix to solving a lot of problems is just check back on your plan a little more regularly. The difference between a novice and an expert, how much time do you think an expert spends planning? Um, that percentage. I'd say about 50% uh, of the time, Only I guess. Only 20. 20%. Only 20, and that's maximum. Real experts, maybe even down to 10 or 15. So an amateur like myself, they either do too much, 50% or 100%, and they don't take action, right? I've known artists who've done that, where they spend all this, I'm writing a book right now. I'm writing a science fiction, right? I'm also an artist. Tell us about the other book you have. Uh, that you oh yeah, It's About Time. Yeah, uh, yeah, so. What's when, the name of it? It's About Time. It's About Time. That was the first book I wrote. Okay. Uh, the first, well, it was the second book I wrote, but that's another story. So when I put It's About Time together, I made a, a plan for that. Right? I had an outline of all my chapters. I had an outline of what I was going to say, where I was going to say it. And it took me about three months to finish writing once I had the plan in place. And I kept consulting back to my table of contents. But I spent 10 years researching before I wrote that book. Okay. Did I need to spend 10 years researching on reflection? No, I actually could have started 10 years earlier. The reason I waited so long is I thought I needed to have a lot more plan. I thought it, I spent too much time planning, right? Mm -hmm. on, the, on the flip side, I tried to write a, a, a fiction. I tried to write this little love story. And I sat down and I just started to write. And I said, I'm just gonna put words on a page. And that's important, you know? Sometimes you do just gotta create. But the problem is without a plan in place, by the time I got to page 30, I ran out of juice. I didn't know where the story was going, where it was gonna go next, who the characters were, what their names were what their place was. So it's a balancing act between too much and too little planning. Most novices spend almost no time planning. They just jump in. They're like, I'm just gonna get it done. Plan as you go? A lot of people plan as they go, if they plan at all. So if I were to impart one thing that metacognition teaches us, it's to take that time at the beginning and throughout to plan. So just pay attention to what we're doing. Now the second piece, and there's a lot, there's eight parts to metacognition, right? Mm -hmm. But the next part I'm gonna talk about that's really useful to artists is what, what we call in metacognition monitoring. But more, you may have heard of mindfulness, you know? And in, in a way, I'll give you an example of mindfulness right now. I bet you there's a part of your mind that's thinking, are these cameras recording right now? Yes, Right. I read my mind. And there's a little bit of- Especially the new one I got. Especially yeah. the new one you got. <laughs> now, that thought is an act of monitoring. And we can look right here at this camera and we can see that it's recording. You see that little red at the top there? Absolutely. And so it's telling me- So it's verification, identify, verify. Exactly, identify and verify. What am I doing and is it doing it? <laughs> am I actually doing what I wanna be doing right now? Right. And so cameras are a really great metaphor for monitoring because we can see whether it's recording. You ever have it where you have a really good take and then you look and it wasn't filming, right? Right, right. And, and then you're like, oh, I wish I would have been monitoring it a little more. I wish right. I would have been on top of it. Or maybe the camera died halfway through. Right. Right? Through That's the take. Happened. And that happens, right? right? So monitoring is about paying attention live in the moment to what we're doing and how it relates to our overall plan. 
how it relates to that overall goal. Is what we're doing connecting to what, where we need to go? And more importantly, is it working? In the middle of presenting, sometimes I pivot because I'm like, ooh, audience isn't feeling the room right now, right? right. And sometimes we gotta do that. Sometimes we gotta pivot live in the moment. That's an act of monitoring and evaluating. I make a decision, is this good or isn't it good? Do I keep going or do I change course? And that kind of monitoring, that is the other huge performance jump. When people put just 10%, maybe 20 max, but if they put just 10% into planning, and then they focus their attention on monitoring, their performance can go up 20%, and their effort goes down. Now isn't that weird? I put in less energy, and I get more results. Because you're focused on the action, the next action. The next action and where I'm at right now. I was gardening this morning, and as I'm digging the plant, I'm thinking, is this the best thing I should be doing right now? Should I get the soil? Should I be digging the plant right now? Should I be, maybe, maybe I should organize? What do you think the first thing I did was? I took all the plants and I put them where I wanted them to go. Then I got all my tools and I laid them out. Then I said, okay, now I gotta decide what order I'm gonna dig them in. And, I, and as I'm digging them, I'm thinking, is this the right order? And you know what I ended up doing? I ended up switching a couple plants. I didn't like my plan. As I was going through, I looked and I said, these colors aren't gonna go. And I picked them up and I moved them while I still could because imagine if I waited a week, they take root. And then it's much harder to move them. Easier to do it at the beginning when I'm digging than, when I, than waiting till later. And there's variables that have that uh, out of your outcome that can change things. You exactly. You water them, they die. Exactly. Uh, you, you know, uh, too much water. So there's variables exactly. in your outcome. Exactly. And when you're putting together a work of art, I just finished doing Vocus Muse, right? I was the director and executive producer of Vocus Muse. And that was a full dance production live. Talk about metacognition. I mean, I had, I, I was the, the brain of the operation, but I had the other brains of the operation just to keep the operation moving. We had a crew of over 50. When you count cast and crew and, 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 we had over 50 people all mobilizing at the same time, all moving at the same time. Sometimes you had to pivot in the moment. Sometimes things just don't work out. You gotta shift. And the easiest time to do that in a production, going back to our film example, is while you're filming. Easier while you have the actors there, while you have the set there and you got the lighting. You're like, you know what? Let's change angles. I don't like this. I know we planned it this way, but we're going to shift. Because I can just feel, let's take another take. I'll tell you of a famous film production. There was this scene where they had the guy run up a sheet of glass and do a backflip off of it. Right? That's not fantastic. What was fantastic is, as he took a backflip off the sheet of glass, they shot a bullet through it and broke the glass. So the timing had to be just right. Just after he does his backflip, they break the glass. Wow. So the timing had to be exactly right. Right. Right? So they took a take. And the director's like, you know what, we gotta do it again. I didn't like that. So they did it again. Brought in another sheet of glass. Boom. Brought in another sheet of glass. Boom. Brought in another sheet of glass. I think they did over 17. Over 17 takes. Because it didn't... It just didn't feel right to the director. And he's like, we gotta go, we gotta go again, we gotta go again. What do you think they ended up using? Plexiglass? They used the first take. The first take. They, but he felt like he needed to go down that journey. You know, that was a lot of cost. You gotta think about how much cost that was on the film to, to put all that work together, clean it up, yes. get the debris, set up another one, do it again. But sometimes you gotta do that. Yeah, and then at some point, you just gotta realize the, the art is finished. And he got it on the first take. So the budget, he's got a big budget. He had that. a big budget to be able to do that. Right. So but if you had a small budget, you might have to just work with what you got. Do a post-production. Yeah. But you and I know post-production is more expensive sometimes than refilming in the moment. Right. Right? But the other reason I bring this up is at some point, artists also have to let go of their work. They have to realize this is, this is where it's going to be right now. You know, not, some people are like James Cameron and they wait 10 years between the projects. And they're like, I'm gonna spend a long time on this one. But you know, when he puts something together, it hits the world stage in the billions, right? Billions of viewers, billions of views, mm -hmm. billions of dollars. He, he has the budget, the time, the resources to invest in his projects like that. But if you look at James Cameron when he first started, it may not have had the same 
length of time that he put into them. So you gotta look at where you're at, your resources, coming back to that, what your resources are, what you have available, what you're gonna work with to get your vision to be real, to get your plan and make it a reality. And then while you're putting that vision into reality, you're monitoring yourself and you're evaluating while you're doing that. You're paying attention. What am I doing right now? And is this the best thing that I should be doing? So when I'm working with a group of artists and we're putting together a live production like we were, sometimes before we do the next scene, I'd say, hold on everybody, we're just gonna take two minutes and we're gonna think about what we're gonna do next. And I just slow down for a moment. Yeah, I know we're in a rush, we got a time crunch, we got a, we got a deadline, right? A lot, of art, a lot of art does have deadlines. So when you have a deadline, that doesn't mean you gotta be reckless. You can be a little bit thoughtful, a little bit. Not too thoughtful, not so much that you don't go anywhere or do nothing, because that's not good either. But you wanna make sure that you're putting in the thoughtfulness while you're doing it, because if you do, you can save a mistake before it even happens. You can catch an error before it even takes place. Right, you see it coming. You see it coming, and you avoid it. And you, you know, you're setting up your camera to take your shot, and you're looking and then something in your instinct is just like, you know, I think something's a bit off here. And then you realize there's something in the background that you don't want there. You're like, hey, get that extra out of the background. And, and now you've saved yourself editing. That little couple seconds, and that little pivot, and now you've saved yourself the effort. So we've got the planning, right? And that's one of the big ones, the storyboard. the storyboard. And then we've got the monitoring, that's that awareness, the tools. That, right, of, of the tools, the awareness of your action, paying attention while we're doing it. Now, I will tell you, monitoring is not easy. It takes practice. It takes practice to be aware live in the moment. For example, while I'm thinking right now, here, talking with you, I'm also thinking about what I'm going to say. I'm aware that we have a conversation that's happening. I'm aware that people are following our thoughts. And I'm thinking, am I on task to what they need? Am I delivering the right ideas? Do I need to go back and cover another point again from a different angle? Or is it good? And yeah, I can move on. That's monitoring. It takes real effort to build that as a habit. Because, and you probably know this, if you have it where you're thinking about too many things at once, what tends to happen? Scatterbrain. You get scattered and you lose track. So for me, I think of it as like a little conscience on my shoulder that just comes up every now and then and says, hey, what are we doing right now? Hey, is it, is it filming? Hey, we got the right angle? Is what I'm doing right now working? That's what I ask myself. Is what I'm doing right now working? And when I ask that question, when it comes up, is what I'm doing right now working? I then can zoom right in to what I'm doing. I evaluate what I'm doing and I can make sure I'm executing it exactly the way I need to without having to worry about it, right? Because when I came into this conversation, I came in with a storyboard in mind. I knew what I was gonna talk about. I was gonna talk about planning. Then I was gonna talk about monitoring. And the last part I'm going to talk about is that evaluating piece, that instinct, okay? There's a lot. Like I said, there's eight parts to metacognition. Today, I'm only talking to you about the big First three. Part. The big three, right? The, the juicy ones that are gonna make the most difference for people. So the last one is how we evaluate ourselves. You know, when you're doing something, there's a part of you that says, I'm doing a good job. But are you? That's the question. That's your perspective. Right, that's your perspective. And with experience, that perspective gets elevated and is more accurate. But we know when someone's a novice, they either think that they're really good when they're not, or they think they're not good when they're great. That feeling we have inside, that's what we believe about ourselves, okay? And what we believe about ourselves needs to be cultivated. We need to pay attention to it. So we gotta ask the serious, honest question, is what I'm doing right now working? And if you think it isn't, look for why you think it isn't, and calibrate, adjust. And then, you know this, you know that old saying, hindsight's 20-20? Mm -hmm. Well, sure, hindsight's 20-20, but did you know foresight? is built on hindsight. Yes. Right? Foresight is built you on hindsight. You have an idea before yeah. it becomes a tangible... I used to be terrible at catching things. I'm just looking for an object I can throw and catch. Okay? My glasses. So I used to be terrible. See? Oh. I'm still terrible at it sometimes. Okay. Right? I threw it and I missed. 
and I threw it and I missed. But I caught it these two times. And I throw it, I didn't even have to look that. Practice time. makes perfect. It does, but it comes with feedback. That first time I missed was excellent. It was a perfect demonstration of what it's like when we're new to things. Because when we're new to something, yeah, we might make a mistake. But my body and my mind, when I, I reflect, I'm like, why did I miss that first one? I know why I missed it. When I threw it, I threw it on a bit of an angle, spun in the air, and I caught it on my middle finger here, like that, and then it deflected. So I said, well, I'm gonna have to put my hand a little more forward next time, and I'm gonna have to throw straighter. So then, I practiced again. You know, when I was young, I was very clumsy. I wouldn't have even, the fact that I caught three out of four right now, that's a big success. I was like 1% when I was young. Now, 75% today, that's good. That's what evaluating is. It's about getting better at recognizing how good you are at something. So a lot of the struggle of an artist is they look at their work and they think it's not good. It's not good enough yet. I don't think anybody's gonna like this. I don't like this. They'll have different voices that come in their head. It's important to listen to that voice, but you have to also take action on the voice. So if you don't like it, try, revise it. But do it thoughtfully. What are you revising? Just because just you don't like it, that's not helpful to you. How can you specifically revise it? What part do you want to tweak? You ever hear of this where an artist has a painting and it's just been sitting in their attic and it sits there so long? That it, there are famous artists who died with hidden art in their attics, in their closets, buried. Nobody even knew they were working on it. Why did it never make light? We don't know. We can't ask them. But for the artists who are alive, who are working on their works, they know why they're keeping that stuff hidden. Maybe it's a personal project, that's fine. Maybe it's something that they're not ready to share with you. That's okay too. But if they're like, well, it's not finished, what about it isn't finished exactly? Because if you can figure out what that is, reflect on it, and then pinpoint it, then you can take action on it, make that modification. Or maybe you just gotta let it go and say it is done. I now, this isn't true about all forms of art, but when I was writing, I remember a, a mentor of mine, I said to him, I keep finding mistakes. I keep finding errors in my work. And he said, yeah, you know, that does happen. He said, I don't know any book that doesn't have a second edition. In other words, with a book, with that medium, you have the opportunity to have a new edit. And even in film, right? You'll have the release and then 10 years later, hey, we went into the archives and we touched it up and we re-released it. They did that with Star Wars. They did that with Indiana Jones. They did that with Titanic, they, right? They, they go in and they zhuzh it up and they re-release with newer stuff, newer special effects, newer layers. There's always opportunity to make another project out of the first project. You know, like recycled art, upcycling, right? You've heard of that. My partner, sometimes she finds an old, uh, uh, an old painting you know, that somebody's thrown out, she takes it and she paints over it. Right. And she puts something new on top. There's nothing wrong with that too. Depends on what your purpose is, where you're headed with it. But the key in evaluating is you have to calibrate that feeling. And here's the key though. You ever have it where people are like, they think they're good at everything or they think they're terrible at everything, right? Yes. It, it comes up. And here's the interesting thing about that evaluation. It's unique. The research has shown this almost definitively. It's unique to every field. Just because you are you are good in music doesn't mean you're also going to be good at visual arts. And just because you're good at painting doesn't mean you're also gonna be good at filming. You might be great at all of them, or you may not. Or you may be a beginner here and advanced there, and over time, this one goes over to there. And if you don't practice, this one drops. It changes over time. So you have to continually evaluate yourself. You have to continually check in. And with specificity, and evidence to tie it back. Evidence, like what do you see in front of you? What specifically is it that's making this work or not work, right? And once you tie that in, it's the reflection. It's going back and saying, why did I feel that way, you know? Let's say I put together a, a work of art and then I present it, I'm at a festival and I put it on display. And then I hear the audience feedback and it tanks. Then I'm like, okay, so what did the audience have to say? And I listen to the audience and then I think, what was my intention, right? Well, what did I plan? Because some artists don't care if the audience loves it. They created it for a different purpose. Maybe it wasn't for our audiences to love. Maybe why it existed won't be loved in this time. 
Maybe it'll be loved in a later time. Van Gogh is a good example of that. He wasn't loved at this time. He's loved now, 100 years later. So why do you make the work? But if audience is what you're catering to, and that is what your goal was, then you do want to listen to that audience, go back, calibrate, make an adjustment to your work, and represent. Or if when you put it together, you look and you're like, I'm not happy with it. I want to do it again. Then you have the opportunity to do it again. I loved doing both these music. That was a wonderful experience, wonderful production. And when it was done, and, and we've actually just released our film, you can get it on uh, vocasmuse.com. Vocasmuse.com. Vocas Vocas v O C A S, Vocas Muse, M U S E, dot com. So you can, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's available for sale now, and people can get lifetime access to watching the opening show, and they'll also get the closing once we get that finalized and put online. And when I watch it, I love it. It's such a great work of art, and I also think I know exactly what I would do differently when I do it again. When it's a finished product. Like it's already a finished product, and I'm already ready to make version 2.0. Because I love it. I love it so much that I'm ready to do it again. And some artists like that. Yeah, the and passion for doing it. That's right. That's right. So to, to sum it up, right, metacognition is when we are paying attention to where our mind is. It's that Remember I said it's the boss of the human mind, right? So it's paying attention to where our mind is. And if all I'm focused on is the task right now, which is where most people are, 80% of their time is focused on the task that's in front of them. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you just add in those other pieces, the storyboard, the plan, the monitoring, is this thing on? Am I being recorded? Is this is doing what I meant the it to do? The, the awareness, awareness right? These guys pounding in the back. I wasn't aware that yeah, they were Yeah, there's a little construction going on Construction today. going on, I didn't yeah. even know. Yeah. I wasn't aware I came here, set up camp at yeah. the round table. Yeah. And, uh, and here we are today. And, and here we are. Fantastic. I think we've got this nice green wall here that's softening that sound. If that wasn't there, you picked a great spot. When you think about it, because even though there's ambient background, it insulated us. With the cars. That's right. Earlier we had the fishermen. That's right. And uh, they're all left. Yeah, I think fishing that time's done. Over. Yeah. Yeah. So you know you've got your storyboard, you got your plan, you pick the location, you got the monitoring. We're making sure this thing's on, and then we're evaluating as we're going on. How's this going? Do I like it? Do we got to start over? I think it's great. If it's great, we keep going. If you got to change it, change it, pivot. And those three pieces put together can have a huge performance difference because rather than wasting effort and doing something again, rather than wasting effort doing something again that doesn't need to be done, rather than spending our energy on tasks that aren't even related to the final goal, we can really refine and focus our energy into the things that matter, the things that really yield the results, and we can achieve those results quicker. And so what I'd love to invite you know, your audience and, and anyone listening to do is to reach out. So where can people contact you? So we're, we're now, we just launched ourselves into socials. So you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. We've got a YouTube channel. I'll be shooting a, a, a cross-reference to, to, you know, this little podcast here through all of those resources. And you can find us under Meta Excellence. We're the only ones. Okay, fantastic. Yeah. Well, thanks for having you on Plug and Play Productions at the Round Table here at Alexander Park. Thank you for having me. It's uh, been a pleasure. I learned a lot from you. So um, we'll see you soon. And uh, be back, be wildered, and uh, be fresh. And uh, we'll have you again for the second part of... of uh, yeah, I'll give you some tips and tricks next time. Tips and tricks for metacognition. For metacognition, yeah, and how to... How to Turn your passion into profits. This is my passion. Thanks yeah. for having you. Thank you. Thank you.